the first person that posted a question was Mina, and she asked, where is that? How does one stay positive when getting to deeper layers of the onion when crazy things come out, but no deal breakers? So what, what she means by deeper layers of the onion is um, uh, Mina's actually someone who's gone through my course. And uh, when I talk about the onion, the layers of getting to know someone, there's the outside sort of social layer that you get to know. And then there's the that sort of inside uh, intimate layer that you so start to get to know sometimes a little bit early, like uh, earlier than uh, like the physical intimacy goes moves faster than the emotional intimacy. And so that inside layer is, you know, sort of the pillow talk and the intimacy and you know somebody sexually and you've shared yourself in that way. So you sort of feel like you know them um, better than you do in the sense that like layer two and layer three are really about the you know familial layer and how they interact with their family and what their stories are and, and uh, all the, the parts of their history that affect their behavior now and also how they deal with conflict resolution and things like that, that um, interpersonal layer, uh, how they deal with uh, conflict resolution and, and you start to really see who somebody is when you know, like when you have your first fight or the first time you see them like drunk and maybe kind of angry or uh, you see how they deal with a crisis or, um, uh, you know, maybe something like losing a job, anything like that. So, um, or positive things, you know, how they celebrate your uh, uh, successes in life as well. So, so relationships are about relating, right? So it's not like a relationship that you get and the person is a certain way, and then that's what you know, and they are sort of required to be that. Really, re relationships are about relating and kind of uncovering the layers and and um, being able to enjoy the process of getting to know who someone is, who, who someone truly is in who and how they are out in the world. Because when you're dating someone, you're not just dating that you're not just dating John, you're dating John and who he, who and how, who he is and how he operates in the world. Okay. Does that make sense? So, um, so that's what she's referring to when she's, she's talking about the onion. So when crazy things come out, but no deal breakers. Okay. <laughs> crazy things come out. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm wondering what this is, what the, what you're referring to, but, um, let's say we're talking the familial layer, you know, and we're talking about maybe some like, especially because we're getting toward the holidays, right? We're getting toward family, uh, inter interpersonal family dynamics, right? Um, but you're saying there's no deal breaker. So one, first I would say, always make sure that you allow yourself the luxury of saying this could be a deal breaker. And the reason I say that is because I want you to be able to sit with the possibility that it is, okay? Is this a deal breaker? And so as opposed to being in resistance to it and maybe denying some feelings that you have around it, go ahead and say, okay, is this a way? Because in your relationship, because I know you took my course last year and you've been in this relationship with a while, for a while and now you're, you're living together. Um, so, and that's for other people reference point. Hi everybody. Oh, are you mad at me? Um, <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, that's so con That's so distracting. Those little, little things. Anyhow. Um, so you're, you're living together and you have to look at, um, is this a deal breaker? How do I feel if I sit with that, if I, I just allow myself my feelings around it, as opposed to maybe saying, no, 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 it's not a deal breaker, and just, give, just giving yourself some room to sit with it so that you can really be with it and feel it and then go, okay, this is, you know, this is not a deal breaker. Okay, so let's say you've gotten to that place. Um, Eckhart Tolle would say, in any life situation, you have three choices. You can uh, accept it you can change it or you can leave. I sort of look at leaving as kind of a form of changing uh, in that if you're in a, but if you're, but I understand what he's saying because if you're in a job situation or family or some sort of system of any kind, sometimes it's not, it's not worth it to try to change that system. It's actually, you change it by removing yourself. 
So if you can accept it, change it, or leave it, then where does that put you? Um, where that puts you is that, and your question is how do you stay positive? Um, your positivity means what? Does that mean um, you're happy about it all the time? Does that mean you like it? Does that mean you can kind of let it go? I'm guessing that that's what you mean. That um, that let's say that let's say the issue is uh, my my boyfriend is really codependent with his sister. Okay, you're probably not going to change that. The only thing that you can change is your response to it, right? So if you're not going to leave and you can't change it, then you need to accept it. So so here you are in a place of accepting. So can you be in love? Meaning. You're not in resistance. You are in love. Can you be in love with that? Can uh, Kyle Cease always uses this little like shorthand where he's like, yes, I feel anxious and I love it. Yes, my friend is codependent with or his sister and I love it. And, and that doesn't mean you like it. That just means that you can be in love with that. And so really, your positivity, your good mood, your, your good feelings around a situation, what that has to do with is just not being in resistance to it. And so if you can just not be in resistance to it, then you're not fighting it. Because if you're in resistance, right, you're like, you can't also be in this place and be, oh, I'm so grateful. I'm so it's like you can't be in those two places at the same time. And so... Um, <laughs> so when crazy things come out, you might just say, that's crazy, and I love it. <laughs> so um, be, because, if, because your partner is a whole result of his whole history and his whole life, right? And so the people that we fall in love with, that we uh, start dating, they were who they were before they met us, and they're going to be you know, a version of that after us, <laughs> should we leave that relationship? And, um, and their history is always going to be their history. It's their history. And when you can be in awe of that, when you can be in reverence of that, when you can be in celebration of who they are at their core and who, are, who they are becoming, then that's really being loving. That's really being loving. When you can, when you can step back and you can essentially celebrate your partner, their history, their growth, their development, their, their blossoming, right? You're not, you're not asking them to stay who they are over here the day you met. You're, you're in awe of their blossoming. That's love. That's true love, right? And that's what we can, can, can hope that somebody might be able to give us as well. So, so that would be my answer to that, darling Mina. And you also asked, how do I stop my trust issues? Ah. How do I stop my trust issues from sabotaging my relationship? Um, again, there's a level of acceptance that you need to have around yourself, right? What if your partner had trust issues? Um, honor, just be with it first. Be with it and, and forgive yourself those trust issues and understand that that's what they are, that they are habits, right? Because your brain's job is to constantly come up with shit to be afraid of right? That's your primitive brain. That's what it does, right? And if you know, if you can say, okay, that's my brain's habit, I'm going to just go like, oh, hi, there's my trust issues and, um, and check in with it. Is it true? Do you really have anything to worry about? You know, I mean, you can like actually check the validity of it, but the first thing to do is to really acknowledge the habit of it because you're calling it a trust issue. So I'm guessing you're saying this is my habitual issue. And so if you can be with that and you can um, give yourself that space, right? That the, the little part of you is scared, right? And that's your brain's job to find things to be afraid of. Um, and then ultimately know that what we are afraid of when we talk about somebody cheating right? Because that's usually what it's about, right? Somebody cheating or lying or making a fool of us, right? Uh, somehow diminishing us, 
because of their behavior, right? Because we put our trust in them, right? This intangible thing we call trust. Ah, I hurt my tooth. Um, uh, this intangible thing called trust. Um, we put our trust in them and then they betray that trust. Um, am I whole and complete? Yes, you are. What they do, what they betray does not take away from your wholeness. So always remember too, that if you are, if you are experiencing betrayal or if you're afraid of betrayal, like if that's sort of the vibration that you're on and that's what you're experiencing, then there's some orientation of betrayal in you because what we experience outside of us is what's going on inside of us. So if you're having trust issues and you're gonna go ahead and acknowledge, okay, this is my habit, right? Then the first thing you have to ask yourself is how am I betraying myself? Now you could also say like what, you know, old uh, familiar voice from the past, you know, i.e. in a previous relationship or a parent, um, uh, betrayed me a lot, where's that coming from? And you can name that, but it's always important too to say, Am I betraying myself in this relationship somewhere? Make sure that you're congruent and that you're in alignment with yourself in the relationship. And then, then you won't be on the vibration and in the orientation of betrayal. And you're highly less likely to be <laughs> experiencing betrayal on the other side. And you'll probably have less fear around it because you won't literally just be on that vibration of attracting that. Now we can't control what other people do, right? And if your, uh, if your partner is somehow betraying themselves in the relationship and they somehow betray you, then, you know, again, that's their path, right? But that doesn't make, that doesn't diminish you. That does not make you less whole and complete in your own being. So, so stopping your trust issues from sabotaging your relationship really is about looking inward first because the way that you sabotage your relationship is to constantly point outward. I'm afraid you're, I'm afraid that you're betraying me. You're betraying me. What are you doing? What are you doing? And that is, that's going to push somebody away, right? Because that, you know, we hear it a lot. Well, it doesn't matter if I cheat or not. I'm going to be accused of it. I'm going to be living in that, in that space. So what does it matter? Like I'm either going to, you know, I, you're going to push them away or you're going to push them to cheat because either way they're living in it. So there's no difference. Right. So, um, so, so the way to stop your trust issues from sabotaging your relationship is, uh, is by looking inward first and looking at how you might be betraying yourself. And if you're not, and if it's just an old voice from the past, then you have to just, you have to give that to yourself. You have to forgive that in yourself and move from, and move from that place knowing that you're whole and complete. So uh, let's see, I have other questions. It's interesting, I can't see the, um, I might be in the wrong view because I can't see comments. So I don't know if I should click something else to be able to see any comments. I'm doing this through Firefox. So uh, I do have like a, a thing on the side here that looks like it would be a space for comments. So, um, but I do have a questions um, from, from earlier. Um, mm, getting past infidelity. I've heard great advice on this site, but couldn't, but couldn't seem to stop the mistrust. Okay, well, that's, that's the same. That, that, I guess that would be along the same lines, the same answer. Um, infidelity, I'm assuming that you mean sexual infidelity. Um, some people would go as far as saying that um, emotional infidelity, uh, online infidelity, some people think looking at porn is infidelity. So um, I think it's very important for you to be clear in yourself what fidelity means. What does that mean to you? Um, because it's important to be clear with our expectations of people um, just for our own energetic purposes and for um, clarity so that we don't set, set each other up for failure. Um, you know, my, my feeling about infidelity is that uh, 
I don't, I don't draw the line too tight because I would never expect my partner not to be taken with or uh, enamored by or uh, affected by another human being, right? You know, if the girl at the if the girl at the check stand at Ralph's is really cute and flirts with him a lot and he likes to go through that line, I kind of can't blame him, you know? Like, I think that's, if that's fun for him and that, like, feeds him in some way, I can't be the only thing that ever, like, feeds his ego or feeds, uh, uh, lets him enjoy the dance, you know, between the masculine and the feminine. I mean, I certainly trust him to not do anything out of the bounds of our relationship, but that's me. That's me. That's my boundary. So everybody has their own Everybody has their own um, line. So, uh, so one, it's important to know what you consider infidelity. And again, getting past it really has to do with the story, right? Because the, the, the act, which you know, we just talked about, can range from anything depending on what you think is um, infidelity. Uh, the story... The, the facts of the story are generally the same. They went out with this person or they slept with this person or they did this. Pretty much the oldest story uh, in the history of humans. But what is uh, the, the oldest set of facts, I should say, but what is your story around it? What does it mean about you? Does it mean that you weren't enough? That's, that's, what you, that's the piece that you have to work on for yourself. Because what he did, why he did it, all those things, that's his path. That's his story. That belongs to him. What you're actually recovering from, what you're getting past is your story around it. What does it mean about you? If you were coming from a place where you knew you were whole, you were complete, you're in the present moment, from that moment there, does it matter what he did? Does it really have any effect? on you from this moment forward. Yes, it may have hurt. Yes, it was, I mean, I've, I've been through it, Tell, believe me. But it's, uh, but does it actually have any true effect on who you are in this moment and for possibility moving forward? Because there is nothing but possibility moving forward. And your mind is stuck in the past trying to, predict what's going to happen in the future, right? And that's the fear. So if your future is based on that, which is done and over with, right? Then if you, if you, if you create your story around that now, yes, that's what you're going to, you're going to continue to experience that because that's going to be your belief about the world. However, the truth is there is nothing but possibility ahead of you. Now we're very uncomfortable as humans with the unknown, but there is nothing but possibility in front of you. And it literally has nothing to do with anybody that you've dated in the past. The only time that still affects you, and it doesn't have to affect you in, an, in a romantic way, is when you're divorced and you have children. And now you have your, 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 uh, your children's uh, father is, because um, I'm talking to a group of women, this group is all women that I'm speaking to right now, um, your uh, your children's father, if he's still in their life and still in your life, he's he's still family, right? And um, uh, it, that interaction interactions with him can still you know affect your life moving forward. But again, it doesn't have to have anything to do with all of the possibility and the unknown and the magic that can happen from this very point forward, this very point forward in your romantic life. And so the the story around the infidelity is your responsibility. That's your responsibility. What that person did, you know, it's like, um, <sighs> Mark Manson talks about in, uh, the subtle art of not giving a fuck. I haven't finished the book yet, so I can't, uh, I can't say it, but, um, he talks about the difference between, uh, fault and responsibility. So like if somebody hits your bumper, it's their, it's technically their fault, right, that you got in the accident, but it's your responsibility to call the insurance company to get your car. It's, it, it's actually your responsibility to go get the bumper fixed. They don't even do that for you, right? They don't come pick up your car and take it for you. Um, so, it's, so that's what I'm saying is your story around the infidelity 
is your responsibility. That's yours to work through. And, um, and you can, you can work on it by, uh, by writing it out. You can work on it by rewriting it. You know, there's things and we can talk about that. Um, I, I think what I might do is talk about that in another post, um, come up with, um, some possibilities for you. I also have a 21 day. It's free. There's an email course you can sign up. Usually I post about it in the group. Um, it's an email, uh, every day for 21 days. That's, um, kind of nice helps you rewrite that story. So, uh, when you give more, another question, when you give more than your partner, how do you stop that dynamic? You stop it. <laughs> you just fucking stop it. <laughs> uh, actually, <laughs> um, you know, this relates to another question I've gotten, which is, um, why is it that I'm so nice that guys leave me? And my, um, my challenge on that would be, how are you nice? Are you nice? Are you kind and warm and respectful and loving? Or are you mothering? Are you taking, you know, have you known him like three, four weeks and you're doing his laundry? Are you like taking care of his dog? Are you like, you know, like when you're giving more, you want to make sure that you're not, you're not mothering. Okay. Cause one, it's just not sexy. Okay. Um, if you're giving more emotionally, which I imagine that's what you're, you're talking about, I guess my question would be, what does that look like? What does that look like? Are you saying I love you and he's not saying it back? Are you more thoughtful? Are you texting first all the time? Are you like, what does that really look like for you? And what I would, what I always do with my clients is to ask them to get really clear about what it would look like if their partner was giving to them. And that's what you need to get clear about. And, um, and, and you can, you can, once you get clear about that, then you have a way to communicate that. And the truth is, if you, let's say I've mentioned this before, um, I had a client who's dating an artist and, um, and he's brilliant, talented, wonderful. Um, but she's getting scraps because he is so involved in his art, like so much so. That's his whole world right now. That's his whole life right now. He's not a great partner. It doesn't mean he's not a great man. He's lovely. He's wonderful in so many ways, but literally she is getting scraps from him, scraps of time, scraps of attention. And we don't get into relationship for that. We get into relationship to feel partnered, to feel joyful, right? So sometimes we forget why we get into relationship. You get into relationship for joy. You get into relationship to feel like someone cares about bearing witness to your life, right? Somebody that you care about bearing witness to their life. And, um, and, and if we're in relationship, like, well, okay, I have a boyfriend. I'm in relationship. Um, I've been chosen. Okay. I have a boyfriend. I never see him ever. <laughs> I'm always frustrated. Then the question is why? Why are you there? Is it bringing you joy? And I'm not saying it's got to be perfect all the time. Of course not. We go through trials and tribulations. But if ultimately <laughs> your partner is not giving to you in, in a way that you have expressed that would feel like love to you, like if you've said, um, you know, it would mean a lot to me if you did this or it feels wonderful for me when you do this. I love it when you hold my hand. I, um, uh, if you're, you know, giving him opportunity to come to you, you're not like texting all day, making all the plans, you know, like doing all of the, uh, a, a, giving all of the attention first, you're giving him room to come to you because somebody can't, they can't come to you if you're already here. You know what I mean? You got to kind of like give them some room so they can come to you and they move at a little different pace. So, um, so ways to change that dynamic would be one slow your role if you're the one always sort of giving the attention um to express what you need uh well to get clear on what you need uh three express what you need and um ultimately decide if that's if that's enough for you if what you're getting is enough for you so 
Um, some people are just simply more giving than others. And honoring the fact that you need what you need is the beginning. So, um, ba, 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 subjects to cover on the first few dates and what not to discuss on the first few dates. Oh man, this is so hard because honestly, like, uh, especially when you're divorced, you know, people say, oh, don't, don't, don't hash out your past relationship on dates. Come on. Everybody does it. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. Whatever subject you cover, um, overall, my advice would be to not get overly negative with it. You know, be generous in your conversation, even about your ex, even about bullshit things that you're like really angry about, you know, just, um, it's really unattractive to like get dragged through somebody's whole, uh, history, right. With their, in their relationship. Oh, hi, little bubbles. <laughs> um, so that's what I would say. So more than topic, I would talk about tone. Um, I, yes, it's better not to hash out your, your ex, you know, the issues with your ex, you know, on your relationship, because it, it really can turn, turn dark really fast. <laughs> but, um, but if you're going to go there, just try to like, keep it light in that sense, because um, <laughs> it's, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of other, other topics. Yeah. Like, I mean, I've literally had guys go through their, you know, like tell me what's going on with their attorneys and their mediation and, their <laughs> and that. Um, and also, you know, on the first date, like, here's what's weird is that you get a lot of information online. Um, sometimes, like, if you're dating online, you can tell if they have kids, they have this and that. And that. If somebody may or may not want to talk too much about their kids, you can ask a couple, you know, a few questions. Sometimes people are very, very private about that, though, and they don't want to go into it too much. So if you just kind of get a sense that they're like, oh, I don't really want to talk about it too much, I would avoid that. Um, but mo mostly um, exes. I think that... Um, great topics to cover are things that um, things that show you uh, let's say I have a I have a list in my course of like good questions uh, especially with men because you want to ask you want you don't want to say like how do you feel um, let me think of an example oh I have this example in my webinar is uh, if you say to a guy so how do you feel about your best friend getting married like that's a feeling question. He's going to be like, oh, I don't know. I think it's fine. But if you ask, uh, so, um, like in a perfect world, like when did, when would your best friend have gotten married or something, you know? And then he'd be like, huh? Yeah, I guess it would have been cool if it happened like, you know, five years from now, cause we just graduated and like, I was hoping we were going to get to go to Europe together, but that's cool. I'm glad he's happy, you know, but that opens up like a whole, now you're actually starting to get to their feelings. Right. So if you ask things like, um, you know, so what's your favorite, uh, what's your, what's your favorite dish, you know, that you look forward to, uh, at the holidays? Like, is there any like food that you guys have at, at home that you don't ever have any other time of year? And then sometimes you'll get them talking about like, oh yeah, my mom always makes this thing, you know, but like, but she passed away. And so my sister's taking it over and it's really good, but it's kind of this cool thing we do. Anyway, now you're starting to like get to know layers, right? You're getting to know more of those interpersonal layers, the, the familial layer, stuff like that. So, um, so that's one way to approach subjects um, on first dates that I think is really helpful. And one of my favorite first date questions is to say, tell me about your best friend because guys kind of light up when they're talking about their bromances and it's kind of cool. And if he doesn't have a best friend, that's kind of interesting to know too. <laughs> so, um, so I, I like particularly like those questions. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Meeting people outside of online dating sites. Um, how to meet new people outside of online dating sites? That's the question. Um, you know, you can meet someone at the grocery store. That's the truth. I've had clients meet the love of their life on Bumble, 
I know people who've been married off Tinder. I know, uh, yeah, I, I met Mark on match.com. Um, I, you know, I've, I've met people in bars, it, but, um, did I say metin? Did I say metin people? I've metin people. Genius. Um, when you get very clear about wanting to meet someone, uh, like you allow yourself to want that and you get clear about what you want and you believe that you can meet that, it kind of doesn't matter where you are. <laughs> now, you can join, if, if, like if you really would like to meet somebody that likes to hike or if you want to meet somebody who likes to rock climb, then you should go rock climbing and <laughs> should join clubs and you like if like when you start to really think about what you want in a guy then go from there you go okay i i want somebody who who really likes to bike you know okay well where am i going to meet guys like that i'm you know maybe i'll join a club maybe i'll go biking every weekend um and I used to, you know, the type of people that you want to meet, like, do you, um, do you like artists? Do you like, like, a really heady sort of uh, smart guys? Like, um, do you want to like, you know, find your way into a, into an Amgen event? <laughs> I don't know. Um, more importantly, though, is, um, you know, you meet them here, basically. I mean, not to sound super, super fucking corny, but really, you know, you you meet them in your heart and you will meet them outside. Literally, I mean, my God, you can meet somebody in a crosswalk. The crazy shit happens. Crazy, crazy shit happens. So I would say that that's the most important thing. But one of the things I really love about online dating is that it does give you this opportunity to kind of make a big statement to the universe about what it is that you really want. I think that um, filling out an online dating profile is sometimes the clearest <laughs> that people ever get about what they want. I've talked to women all over the country on the phone and sometimes I hear them say things like, I'll say, what do you really want in somebody? And they're like, I just want somebody who's serious about relationship. What man is going to be like, that's me. That's me. I can't, I'm, I'm dying to be that guy. I want to be that guy. I want to be serious guy. I want to be serious about a relationship. And they're just not. So if all you're looking for is like, God, I just want somebody who's honest and who's serious about relationship. More likely because you're in such lack around it, you're going to, every guy you meet is going to be not serious about relationship and not honest. So you know, this shit is baseline, right? Somebody who's kind, somebody who's, you know, ultimately eventually wants a relationship. Um, that stuff is baseline. Like you want to meet a good person. Yes. Okay. Now tell me more, tell me more about him. What do you, what do you like? How does he, how does he, um, does he put his hand on the small of your back in public? Does he, what is your, what does your sister or your brother say about him? Does he like to cook? Does he, um, does he like lots of different food? Does he, um, is he a morning person? Is he a night person? Like tell, like tell me more, get specific and really allow yourself to be brave enough to actually want what you want. Do that. And that's going to draw something much more specific into your life. Not something that you're in lack about, not something that you're in resistance to, you know, the more you keep saying, I just need to meet somebody who's honest in your lack, you're just going to meet a bunch of liars. So, yes, honest, kind, baseline. These are baseline things. Baseline. Go beyond that. Get brave. Ask for what you really want. Tell the universe what you really want. Uh, da, 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 da. Dating friends when your ex is part of that circle. I don't know, man. <laughs> um, that's tricky. Of course, that's tricky. Um, how, you know, how long... How long have you and your ex been apart? Uh, gosh, I'm trying to think. Um, and what's your relationship like with your ex? You know, I mean, let's see, I've been divorced almost like nine, ten years. <sighs> I'm just trying to think, put myself in that position. If I was going to date somebody that he knew, I mean, we're friends, so I'd probably say something to him. 
and it would probably be really, really weird. Um, I mean, my ex is with somebody that was our good friend. So, you know, and that was really, really hard. So, um, there's just so many people in the world. Do you have to date that person? <laughs> That's probably not the best advice. <laughs> All right. I don't have more questions here. I can't see the, um, like I said, I can't see the little comments and I'm not sure how to, to see them without screwing this up. So I'm going to go ahead and end. I want to just tell you guys, if any of you are in the Los Angeles area, I'm going to be doing a one day workshop at the Alex theater in Glendale on February 3rd at 10 AM. And, um, I would just, I would love for you to be there. We're going to, we're going to go over what you need to uh, look for in a relationship and what you need to nurture in a relationship. It's for men, women, singles, couples, polys. I don't care. You're all welcome. Anybody who loves is welcome. And it's going to be a fantastic day. And I have a, uh, a love for singing um, standards, jazz standards. So I'm going to work that in. And I just hired an amazing pianist. He's totally adorable. And we're going to do some music for you just to give us a common ground and to talk about how music gives us room for our emotions and also to remind us that matters of the heart are indeed timeless. You are not alone in your struggles. And I'm glad that so many of you have felt that in this group, that you have um, been able to find some camaraderie and some uh, support. I love how everybody's treating each other in this group. I think it's really wonderful. I'm, I'm, it just, I'm just, I'm just proud of the women in this group. You guys are awesome. So um, thank you for joining me on Facebook Live. And I will do it again, if not next week, right after that. Okay? Mwah. Bye. Da, 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 da. I don't know how to end this. There it is. Finish.